today we'll begin our unit on Christianity. And in this first lecture, what I want to do is really give something like a character sketch. Um, taken together as one unit in all its variations, Christianity is the most widely practiced tradition in the United States. Um, and it does tend for us to be the most clearly understood of the world's religious traditions. But that bar of understanding is low. Um, and with Christianity especially, our lack of understanding is often compounded uh, by a shared illusion uh, that we do understand a great deal more than often we actually do. Um, if only by cultural infusion, a, a sort of osmosis of exposure, most of us know something about Jesus. Jesus. And what, what we know about Jesus, or how we think about Jesus, uh, will in large part be determined by our own families, communities, media outlets, um, even geography. So if you're interested in how the figure of Jesus has been understood and how that understanding has changed throughout American history, um, I recommend to you this book, American Jesus, written by Steve Prothero, whom you're reading for this class, you'll learn all kinds of fun facts from this book, like the fact that um, celebrating Christmas was illegal in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So it is, it is quite a various history. So what we'll look at today, just to get a feel for the field, is a series of roles that Jesus of the New, Christian New Testament has been understood to play. From the time of his birth, away in a manger, um, this homeless newborn has given advocates for social justice projects uh, concentrating on marginalized and impoverished populations um, something to work with. Sometimes people have no place to sleep, and remembering that the savior of the Christians around the world was once one of these people can open the door to a more empathetic stance, even to humanitarian work. Um, Far more common is the understanding of Jesus as the Good Shepherd caring for and leading his followers to a safe haven. Uh, this is among the earliest characterizations of Jesus, as you can see from this fourth century statue. It was found in the catacombs. Catacombs are uh, underground grave sites. Um, and it was popular early on because it could be used as a symbol for Christianity without declaring too loudly that it was a symbol for Christianity. This was, this was really important during the time before the Roman Empire became the Holy Roman Empire called itself the Holy Roman Empire at the point where it turned to Christianity. Um, before then, Christians were being sought out and killed in brutal ways on a regular basis. Um, now, I love this image. Uh, th this moment in the narrative gets precious little attention, though it's among the most gripping scenes in the Gospels. Jesus was not always stalwart in his dedication to his divine mission. Um, and we forget that. Here in the Garden of Gethsemane, following what's come to be known as the Last Supper, Jesus gets on his, hands, gets on his knees and begs God to let him off the hook. Um, he's scared, he's in doubt, and he's so uh, under pressure, so under stress that he actually sweats blood, um, which we can see here. In a world where we are often encouraged to sort of keep up the pretense of strength, even in our most broken moments, uh, it's good to see that even the spiritual exemplars of our world have themselves been at times unsure. And it gives, again, points of access to a culture, um, uh, points of access to our spiritual heroes for a culture that, you know, is imperfect. That's, that's us. Now, we'll look further at this vision of Jesus as the suffering servant in later lectures, especially when we turn our attention to the way that Christians have interpreted the Hebrew Bible. Uh, as in many ways announcing the coming of Jesus. Remember we said with the Jews that the Talmud was a lens through which to read the Hebrew Bible. Remember the Talmud. Um, we talked about that a couple couple lectures ago. And, and, and it was a lens through which to he read the Hebrew Bible for Jews. Well, this is an example of how the Christian New Testament has uh, functioned as a similar lens. And so we'll see this suffering servant um, later, Hebrew Bible prophets like Isaiah spoke of the suffering servant who would come to heal the sinful masses, um, and Jesus was understood to be that for Christians. And then, of course, we have the resurrected Christ, the embodied living dead. Uh, this is an image of Thomas, and this is where we get doubting Thomas, um, that phrase. One of the apostles requiring of Jesus some physically palpable evidence of his presence. Uh, and it's from this vignette, you know, again, that we get doubting Thomas. In the narrative, Jesus is resurrected, but in fleshy form. Um, for God is understood to have conquered death, to be, as we saw in Judaism, in control, not, uh, in control of and not, not bound by the laws of nature. And that comes through uh, with the resurrection. Increasingly, in the contemporary period, people have been interested in the cosmic rather than the personally embodied form of Jesus, the cosmic Christ as its um, cosmic Christ, as he's been come to uh, be known, is uh, 
here envisioned by Alex Gray, understood as something of an imminent divinity. And imminent is something that we will see increasingly as we move towards the tradition of traditions of the so-called East. Um, it's opposed to uh, transcendent. So the transcendent understanding of, of a deity is that deity that sits above all else as its own unified agent and sort of reaches down and acts. Well, an imminent sense of divinity is one that, that bubbles up from, in, from within, that lives within and expresses itself um, from within each of us. And, and that's become increasingly popular, this, this sense of imminent divinity that imbues all matter with a sacralized energy, um, a sort of mystical potency that we all have access to, and in fact do channel in one way or another, knowingly or not. One reason why this vision has become so popular is that it's responsive to interreligious dialogue, um, as well as to environmental concern. Um, but it isn't just the mystical, it isn't just the environmental that the figure of Jesus has gained purchase within. Uh, Jesus is as much a model for those that work in the commercial arena. This image is taken from the local humor magazine, Savage Henry, but it's a trope with far earlier roots. Uh, in Bruce Barton's 1929 novel called The Man Nobody Knows, um, Jesus appears as a businessman working within the commercial, commercial sphere, and characters are called upon to act as Christians in that arena. Um, so there's nothing that's sort of you know, morally exempt from this, this call. People from all walks of life have understood Jesus as a realistic model for their own actions. And Jesus, the businessman, is one example of that. Um, and what about those folks whose walks of life are non-traditional? Some Christians have found this film to be offensive. This is from Dogma. Um, but offensive or not, and that's not really why, why we're using it here, the buddy Jesus partic participates in a larger historical narrative where reformulations have become, for many, the way that one might bring a spiritual model to contemporary relevance. Um, now, a syncretist, which is what's here, is one who blends aspects of more than one religion into a more or less coherent spiritual stance or religious worldview. Uh, a, a phenomenon of the contemporary world, readily visible here in Humble, is how frequently and comfortably this is done. Um, so for many, understand Jesus, understanding Jesus is spiritually relevant as a moral model means seeing him in consort or uh, relationship with spiritual exemplars from other traditions. Um, and here we see Jesus with Krishna floating happily together in India or heaven. Um, a more traditionally accepted vision of Jesus shows him to be the teacher or guide. Uh, this is the Jesus who was loved by Thomas Jefferson, for instance, and whose words were um, excerpted from the larger gospel narrative by Jefferson to create what's come to be known as the Jeffersonian Bible. It's a vision that many find accessible because it's street level. It's a human vision. It's, it, it, it doesn't concern itself with the miracles, which some folks find very hard to accept or, or live into, but, but with the um, pragmatic lived experience of ethical, uh, of ethical teachings. Um, so more supernatural is the vision of Jesus as performing miracles. And this is the Jesus uh, that hit the cutting room floor in the Jeffersonian ber version of the Bible. Here, the divine power of Jesus is what's highlighted. This Jesus is less a model for human behavior um, because we can't do this, and more a model before whom one stands in, in awe and, and deep gratitude. But again, the human and the heavenly, the personal uh, and, the, and the distant, these aspects are forever engaged in something like a balancing act. And in the contemporary world of social media, Jesus is figured with all the proximity of any other friend. And I challenge you to really deal with the question of how media, social media technology and the kind of friendships that we um, develop there might, might uh, compromise our sense of what intimacy means. And, and you know, as you live in your social media world, it's really try to keep that in mind. Intimacy is not something you get in social media, though it has a great number of uses, um, not least of which is to make Jesus your friend. Um, and then here, as here, he's often pictured in all the isolation that we might find ourselves in. When times are difficult, circumstances are less than desirable, and temptations abound. Uh, you know, we know what this feels like, and it's it's really the point of, of all these images. Each, each of them would like to tap into a part of the human experience, into a part of what it means to live in this embodied existence while reaching for the sacred. Um, but of course, with the figure of Jesus, there's only so far that these visions can go in the realm of commiseration, because for tradition, Jesus was really a unique being, direct descendant of God, uh, one aspect of the Trinity. And we'll see this more and more as we move through, Trinitarian Christianity is, is the majority of Christianity, and it, um, you know, Jesus in this in this image is Son of the Father, who is 
the divine God, most Christians, as we'll see, are Trinitarian, which means that the single God has three aspects, two of which are introduced by this image, Jesus, the Son, part of the Trinity is being baptized by his cousin John, also known as John the Baptist, we'll see him, uh, while the Holy Spirit, third part of the Trinity, alights in the form of a dove. Um, God the Father, who is the first part of the Trinity, speaks from heaven in the gospel narrative describing this scene, and, and we will look at it later. And here we have another miracle, um, the first of Jesus' miracles, according to the text, and this one happens to be at a party. Um, this is where Jesus turns water into wine, and Christians have seen this story as an indication that Jesus came not just to heal our wounds, but to increase our joy. Um, there's a really good poem by Richard Wilbur, Wilbur um, called Wedding Toast, which I recommend to you. Um, and, it, and it speaks to this, this miracle theme, this particular image. And at times in anger, also, uh, Jesus is under, understood to have come to advocate for just institutions. The way things are, the status quo, is sometimes just not enough. And as much as we'd like to keep to the joy, Jesus is also a model of how at times we're called upon to speak truth to power um, and just to turn over tables. You know, really, you don't, sometimes you don't get to just sit back and watch. Is this what this image says? Now, all of these models and more are alive and well in the world, engaged by people around the world, but it's the last two that most clearly represent the role that Jesus has come doctrinally to play in Christianity. He's a redeemer, uh, buying back through his own suffering the sins of the world. Um, and in, a, in another way of saying much the same thing, he's a savior, offering spiritual salvation uh, to a sinful population. Now what's up with this fish? I'm sure most of you will recognize this. It shows up all over the place in sort of the car magnets and stuff. Um, how does this mean savior? So look here. The, uh, the Greek word for fish is ichthus. Um, ich, ichthus. Which is, uh, that, that's, what, that's how you say uh, fish in, in Greek. And, um, and it's an acronym for Jesus Christ. Uh, God's Son, Savior. So that's how the fish comes to mean uh, comes to mean Savior as a symbol. It was useful for early Christians because it allowed them to communicate secretly with one another. As a Christian, you'd sort of walk up to a person in public, casually draw an ark with your sandal in the in the sand in the in the dirt, um, and and wait. And if the person was also a Christian, somebody with whom you could commune. Um, you'd know it when he or she drew the second arc um, to complete the simplified form of a fish. So it had a number of purposes, this sign, and, and then, you know, you could really quickly erase it. Oh, yeah, never you mind, Romans. We're, we're not looking to be, you know, um, thrown to the lions. And, uh, and, and so it's one more example of how sort of historical necessity has led to symbolic reality in a way that most of us just don't know. Um, so there's an introduction to some of the ways that Jesus has been understood by people in various cultures and throughout the history of Christianity. Um, it's, it's been by no means a comprehensive picture, um, but it's been an it is an interesting question. You might think about it. How has how the figure of Jesus functioned in your own life? Are you familiar with uh, the char any characterizations that I've missed here? You know, and I've definitely missed a bunch of them. Um, you know, for such a influential figure in our history, this is a this is a very, that's a various picture. Um, everybody's got a version of Jesus and they're, and they're not, you know, they're not consistent. So, um, so it's worth thinking about. In the next lecture, we'll talk about the cultural, political, and textual context into which Jesus was born. Um, and after that, we'll turn to uh, the incarnation, uh, the spiritual and theological fact of the incarnation and, uh, and the gospel narrative.